If you were one of the brave souls that followed me last year, as I went from an empty directory all the way through a completed project that I ended up publishing as a manuscript, you know that I am a stickler for organization. Well, in this episode of Code Club, I am going to show you my philosophy for organizing projects and three different ways that we can get our project into good organizational shape. We'll do that using the graphical user interface of my Mac uh, computer, or you might do with uh, Windows Explorer, the Finder uh, in Windows. We'll also do that using exclusively all R commands, and then we'll also do it from the command line, and I'll tell you why you might pursue one approach over another. So why am I such a stickler for organization? Well, invariably in every project, there's going to be a period of time where the project will pause, right? So as I'm recording this, I am coming back from the holiday break where I took maybe a month off, uh, and I'm not quite sure what I was doing before that break, right? Well, if I can look at the organization of my project, if I can look at the directory uh, at the root of my project, and very easily see where everything is, then it makes it a lot easier to come back into the project. I can see where the code is, I can see where the raw data is, I can see where the results are. It makes it much easier for me to navigate the project. And so if it's easier for me to navigate my own project a month later, then imagine how much easier it is for someone else to navigate your project when they're coming to it fresh. A number of years ago, I had a graduate student or postdoc, I forget, I forget exactly who it was, I just remember this event. Um, I went into their project directory and there were thousands of files. I'm, I'm serious, thousands of files. And it was impossible for me to navigate what was going on in that directory. There was no organization. Imagine if instead I had come into that directory and I could see things like code, uh, uh, data, raw data, process data, uh, the manuscript directory, results, tables, figures, right? If I had separate directories for each of those and perhaps had a readme file and the, the root of the project, it would be so much easier for me to then approach the work that somebody else had done. So that's what we are going for. I realize that the project we're currently working on only has maybe seven or so different files, so it's not that big of an organizational nightmare yet. <laughs> but it's not too hard to believe that, you know, if we kept maturing this project a bit, it might get a little bit more hairy uh, to kind of look at all these different files if we don't first impose some type of organization. So you can see here my distances directory. This is the directory where I'm uh, keeping track of all the files that relate to this project that we're currently kind of working on developing here. And I've got a couple different types of files in here, right? So I have a few different distance matrices. These are the, the files. We have uh, some code. Uh, it's not hard to imagine that at some point we might have a results directory. We might put our figures and the submission uh, directory. We put all the stuff that we might want to submit when we're ready to submit the manuscript for publication and for peer review. So what I would do um, in a very easy case like this is you could use the uh, finder window to organize it, right? So we could do new folder um, and I'll call this code. And I'll go ahead and put read matrix into that code directory. Go ahead and create another directory that I'll call data. And I can go ahead and move these files into data. And I'll go ahead and create a directory called results. So one of the things to keep in mind is that while I don't every episode tell you that I am committing uh, the changes to a Git repository, I am. <laughs> and so one of the challenges of using Git with a project like this where we have directories that are empty is that Git really only keeps track of files and kind of the path to those files. Git's not gonna know how to keep track of the history of the results directory if there's no file in that, right? So Git will keep track of the history of a file, not the history of a directory. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna copy this readme file into results and I'll go ahead and open this. So this is the readme file opened in the Atom text editor. And again, it doesn't matter where you do it as long as it's a text editor. I'm gonna go ahead and delete everything in it so it's an empty readme file now. And so now I have a file in my results directory that it's at least kind of a placeholder for this directory. And so if I expand all these directories, you can see the organizational structure, right? So I have code in my code directory, data in the data directory, and that readme file in the results directory holding the place. Also at the top level of the project, what I call the project root directory, you'll see these three directories as well as an rproj file, license, and the readme file. So the next approach that I wanna take is showing you how we can use commands from base R to go ahead and organize our project. 
if you look down at the files tab here of my R Studio window, you'll see that I've reverted everything back to the way they were. So you might be asking yourself, why would you ever want to do these file and directory manipulations in R versus the graphical interface? Well, first of all, you don't always have the benefit of a graphical interface. For example, my lab does a lot of work up on, in the cloud on a high performance computer at the University of Michigan that does not have a graphical interface. And so all the manipulations we have to do uh, would either be at the bash shell prompt, uh, so basically in Linux, or from within R. Alternatively, sometimes you might also want your scripts to generate directories that are then used to deposit new data, or to perhaps get a listing of all of the files in a directory that you then want to feed into some script that might synthesize all that data together. And so it's not totally ridiculous to think that you would like to use R to do file and directory manipulations. So let's go ahead here in R and I will show you how we can recreate that directory structure that I showed you uh, using the finder window. So I think the first useful function to get under our belt is list.files. These are the files. These are the seven files that we saw previously. And so now we want to go ahead and create some directories that we can then move these files into. To, to create directories, we can do dir.create, and then I can do data in quotes, and I can do dir.create code, but that, again, that needs to be in quotes, dir.create, and then I can do results. Right? And again, if I do list.files now, I see that I have these three directories in here. I have code, data, and results. And I can look at the contents of any of those directories by doing list.files, and then I can say data, right? So that will show me the contents of the data directory. And the actual argument for this is the path, right? So I can say path equals data, and there's nothing in there. So we have a couple different approaches for moving files into the individual directories. So the first approach that I'll use is file.rename. And so that is going to rename a file. And so you might be thinking, how are we going to rename it to get it to move into that other directory? Well, I could take, uh, in quotes again, read matrix.r. So that's what we're going to, the original name, and we're going to name it to code forward slash read matrix.r. And if I do list.files and the path again being the code directory, I now see that that file is in there. And if I do list files without any argument, I get the current. Uh, directory listing, and I no longer see that readmatrix.r script in the project root directory. So that's one way to do it. Another approach would be to copy the file from the current directory into a new directory and then delete the copy from the current directory. File.copy readme.md, and we're going to copy it into uh, results. So again, if we do list.files on results, we see readme.md. Again, if we do list.files, we see that we still have readme.md in our project root directory. Now, what I could do if I didn't want to keep that readme.md would be to do file.remove on readme.md. But I don't want to do that because I really want to have that readme file. And actually, what I might do is I'm going to go ahead and remove the readme.md file that's in my results directory that I just created <laughs> because I don't want that readme. I want a blank readme. If you recall what we did just a minute ago, uh, we created a blank readme file. So I'm going to go ahead and remove that. And now if I do list.files on results, I see I don't have anything there. But what I could do would be to do file.create and then I could say results forward slash readme.md list.files on results and I see that that file is there. If I came over to results and opened up readme, again, it is a blank file, which is what I wanted because I want a file that's there as a placeholder for Git to keep track of. Again, if we look where we're at with list files, we currently still have those three distance files. We want them to be in our data directory. Now, imagine instead of three, we had 303, right? Or 33. I wouldn't want to do this uh, file rename over and over again or copy and delete um, over and over again, I'd want to kind of minimize the number of steps that I was doing this under. So what I might do instead would be to use list of files, and I'm going to get the listing of all the files that satisfy the criteria I'm interested in. So I could say pattern equals dist. So this will list all of the files in the project root directory where I'm at, or whatever path I might give it, that have dist in it, right? And so I see 
dist in distances, as well as these three other distance matrix files. So I might want to make my pattern a bit more specific. And so what I might do would be to put a period, but this pattern is part of what's called a regular expression. And a period in a regular expression will match any character, not just the period. So if I wanted to match the period, I could do backslash, backslash, period, dist. I now get these three distance matrix files, and I can call these dist files. And now I can take those dist files and I can copy them uh, and then delete them from their current situation. If you have more advanced uh, skills with regular expressions, you could probably do the same thing with file rename. I will leave that to you as homework, but I'm going to do it here with file copy and file remove. So how would we do it with file copy? Well, I'll do file copy, and then the from will be dist files, and two will be to data, right? So I get three trues saying it worked, list files on data. I get those three uh, distance files, which is good. Uh, of course, if I do list files, because I copied it, I still have them in my project root directory, but I can do file remove on dist files. I get all trues, and again, if I do list files, I now see that those three distance matrix files are gone, uh, but I still keep this distances.argproj. Very good. So now I have the same setup of my project that I had previously when I used the graphical interface. Now, there is a downside to this approach. If we look in the upper right corner, we'll see what happens. Git thinks that I deleted all of these files that I moved. And so I've broken uh, the history. I've broken the timeline of commits for all these files by moving them into new directories. And so while that's not the end of the world for the, some of these files, it's not so desirable. I'd prefer to do it perhaps in a manner that allows me to keep track of the version history of all these files. To do that though, we need to be able to run R from the command line interface. And to do that, we are going to use the terminal window in R Studio. So to get a shell window open, a terminal, uh, you can come to tools and then new terminal. And this then opens up a new terminal. Uh, it opens it up for me in my distances directory. I'm on the main branch. Again, um, I have some extra things added to my bash environment to tell me the weather. Uh, it is cold out, um, as well as to tell me what branch I am uh, in my project. You probably don't have any of these unless you watch that previous episode I made about a year ago um, um, on how to customize your bash environment. But I'm here in distances. And if I run ls, I see the contents of my directory. I did go ahead and get rid of all those directories and put all the files back into the main project uh, root directory so we can show you how to do this with the command line. Of course, I'm using the terminal window here within our studio, but know that this is the same as if um, I were using bash or a bash window uh, to log in to say a, a remote computer like I have um, for our high performance computer. Um, and so this would be the same type of thing using a, a shell-like environment. So to create the directories I want, I could do mkdir code, right? And if I do ls, um, I see those uh, things listed. If I do ls hyphen f, I see now what files or what names in here are directories. Uh, code now has a forward slash with that dash f argument to see uh, what is a directory. Uh, if I want to make multiple directories at the same time, I could of course do mkdir results data. I now see that I have code, data, and results in my directory as directories themselves. Now, I want to be able to move my distance files to data, my code to code, and to put a readme file inside of my results directory. But again, I want to be able to do this in a way that respects the history of the files. So to do that, I'm going to use the mv command, so short for move, but I'm going to use it within git. So watch how I do that. I can do git mv read matrix dot r code. So this is going to do a git move of read matrix r into code. If I do git status, no longer do I see that it thinks it deleted the file, but it sees that it thinks it renamed the file. And if I look up at my git window here in our studio, you'll see that it no longer has that delete, but it recognizes that I've renamed the file. And so this way, again, we can keep track of the history of the file. 
of course, I can do the same type of thing where I do git mv star dot dist. And so this will match those files that end in dot dist and I can move them into data. Again, if I do git status, I now see those four files that I have renamed. And of course, if I do ls data, I see those three files. And if I do ls, I now see that I only have three files and three directories here in my project root directory. The next thing that I wanna do is go ahead and create that empty readme file in the results directory so that I have a placeholder for results. You'll notice that when I ran git status, it's not trying to keep track of results because there's nothing in results for it to keep track of. I mentioned this earlier, right? So what I can do is I can use a function called touch. So touch will touch <laughs> and bring into existence a new file. So I can do touch results forward slash readme.md. And this again will touch it, create it. And again, if I do get status now, it now says, oh, there's an untracked file in results, right? So this is a new file for get to keep track of. And if I do ls on results, I see the readme.md. And if I did cat on results readme, I see that it's an empty file, okay? So we'll go ahead and add that to our git repository. I'll do git add results readme, git status. We see that we have those four renamed files as well as the new file. And if I then do git commit, and I'll say um, organize project, I now see that everything uh, has been committed and changed. And if I do git status, I see everything is good and it's ready for me uh, to push those up to uh, GitHub. If I come over to our studios Git tab here and click the refresh, it says everything is good to go. And again, we're ready to push those commits up uh, to GitHub. Go ahead and see if you can use these three approaches to organize a project that you're working with. Again, it's not so important how you do it, but that you do it. Keep practicing with these concepts and we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.